Diane Cunningham is the president and founder of the National Association of Christian Women Entrepreneurs, as well as a consultant, author, video guru, artist, plane crash survivor, marathon runner, and former master's level therapist. She has been called a creative machine and a Pied Piper of people. As much as she is able to impart her secrets of success to other women, she is very candid that life has thrown her a series of curveballs and recognized that God took her to a rock-bottom place from where she had to find courage in Him to keep going. Hi there, I'm Diane Cunningham. I am the founder and president of the National Association of Christian Women Entrepreneurs, but bigger than that, I am a coach, I'm an artist, I love helping women to really start again. I'm originally from Yucaipa, California, which is uh, a relatively small town, in, all things considered, in California. It's uh, near Palm Springs, a couple hours from Disneyland and the beach. And my family, uh, my parents are both teachers and my two sisters are both school teachers. And I have only recently figured out I'm actually a teacher too. I just teach differently. But it was just a, it was a, a really strong education environment, an environment of learning, an environment of uh, there's always uh, something to learn from every experience. I was the oldest of three girls. And I uh, really dove right into the oldest child role of being very responsible. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just, I was really good at school. I love learning. I still love learning. I've been journaling for years and years and, and just a part of really learning how to process my own feelings, but uh, learning to, to love words, learning to love words and get those out on a piece of paper. And I really think that I, I thought about being a writer because I remember reading the Nancy Drew, all the Nancy Drew books and <laughs> having that concept of maybe I could write, maybe I could write, write stories. My family was a, a stable family, but I would say there was some pieces missing for me. One of the ways that came out in tangible ways for me was an eating disorder. And it, it felt like the only thing I could control. My parents ended up getting a divorce much later. I'm sure I was already a counselor at heart. And I, I knew that my parents' marriage was, something was off, but I didn't know what, and I didn't know how to help, and I didn't know what else to do. Um, and so I, there was just this heaviness that I felt on, I don't know how to fix this. I think that every child internalizes things differently. We can, you can grow up in the same family and everybody turns out totally <laughs> different. <laughs> um, but I remember feel, I mean, I'm a very much of a feeling person and emotional and uh, that's how I'm wired. And so I ended up either binging, binge eating over that to comfort myself. Uh, and then that uh, would uh, flip to the other side. And then I would starve myself because I felt like I needed to be smaller, be smaller, take up less space. In the middle of all that, of course, you want to be loved. And there was a, a, a feeling, I guess, that you're supposed to know that you're loved. There wasn't much touching in my family. There wasn't much I love yous. There was just, um, that just wasn't a part of our dynamic. And I desperately, now looking back, know that I was starving for that. I was starving for some hugs and I love yous and you're pretty. And I, I, I didn't have that. Uh, I started to numb my feelings through the food. I actually, on my 18th birthday, with my family's permission, you had to be 18 to go to the location I went, but I, we, I admitted myself for a 30-day uh, inpatient eating disorder program because I just felt crazy. I still have to pay attention. I'm still really very aware of food and my thinking about food and, and that it's distorted sometimes. Um, I've weighed 203 pounds and I've weighed 122 pounds and I know that my healthy weight is in the middle <laughs> and, uh, and that it's okay. It's okay. Uh, and learning to love my body and learning to love the body God gave me. It's different than yours and, and the girl next door and, and everybody has a different one and obviously God knows what he's doing. So it's been a, it's been a process. 
I went and got my master's in counseling and I was working, I worked at a hospital in the employee assistance program and then I also had a private practice. One of my clients made the decision to kill himself. And so that, uh, that was a tragedy in and of itself, but then it, it led on, led for me into a journey where um, I was eventually sued. It was a four year, a four year journey for me from from beginning of his death and then the funeral and then the filing of the being served with a lawsuit and then walking through that legal battle uh, four years from start to finish. By the end of that, um, I had been named negligent and um, and basically malpractice, you know, the red mark on my on my certification as a counselor. It just it rocked me. It, it broke me. It, um, you know, I fought, I did the legal things, I, I went to, I did the deposition, I was in the deposition room from nine in the morning till five at night and uh, being questioned. And I mean, it just, it, it broke me deep down um, to my core. I've had moments in my journey, and I wanna be very honest about this, where I've, I've considered suicide because I think it's important that we talk out loud about that. There was a few times when I was early young, when I was in the eating disorder phase that I considered that, but there were some moments of, of that being a, a question in my mind uh, during this lawsuit uh, aftermath, I would call it. Really thinking that maybe my husband would be better off if I wasn't here. Um, and, and then that thought scaring me, uh, obviously that a whole event shaped and changed my, my career. It, it led me out of counseling and, and pretty quickly after into more of the coaching. And now I can look back and see God's hand, of course, in all of it. It led me eventually to, uh, become a life purpose coach after the lawsuit and, uh, the move to Texas, and then um, eventually our move to Wichita Falls, um, which is where I lived when I created the National Association of Christian Women Entrepreneurs. So I launched NACWI. It's 20, you know, it's the year is 2010, May 11th. And in the middle of this, I'm married. Um, Robert and I, uh, we we tried to have children, and that just didn't happen for us. That was just a, a deep grief that seemed uh, to really add to my internal dialogue that said, what is wrong with you? You know, you're not enough. You know, every woman can bust out a child. What's wrong with you? Looking back on it now, I mean, I drank every night. I drank every night. I just, I thought everybody did. You know, we, I mean, my husband and I would, you know, get done with the day and have a glass of wine or sit out on the back patio and and talk and um, and so, I mean, it wasn't inappropriate. Um, or I'd meet some girlfriends and we'd have margaritas. I don't think I was drinking alcoholically at that time. I do remember feeling like I'm leading and teaching and, and sharing all this passion and inspiration and joy with the whole wide world over here with NACWI. And I don't have any in- passion in my marriage. I don't have any uh, I, got, I got all of my love and my affirmation from serving these women and being in business. And so that led into that double life feeling too, like I'm a fake, like I'm a fake. I don't want to be a fake. I don't want to live a, a life that's two different people. The divorce happened in 2011, but I believe that was one of the turning points for the drinking. Then I was living by myself leading NACWI all day, which is basically virtual. So phone calls, webinars, and and emails. And um, then at night, kind of feeling anxious. I, rem- I remember feeling, I wouldn't have called it anxious. I-, I-, I don't know what I would have called it. But by the afternoon, I was ready for a drink. The double life was exhausting. It was overwhelming. You begin to not know... Um, <sighs> I mean, this is who I am during the day, and then at night, it that it it was like at night I got to be this fun girl. She's fun. She paints, and she laughs, and she can live in freedom. And I felt, I think, I felt more and more stifled 
during the day that I was supposed to be this good, godly, churchy girl. I don't know. I mean, maybe I made those rules up for myself. Um, I'm sure I did. But it, uh, it came to a head uh, when I um, hit that, my last few weeks and months of drinking. When I finally walked into the doors of AA and said, you know, I think I might be an alcoholic. I think I was afraid about money. I was afraid about, am I going to make it? You know, is this all going to work? What's going to happen? What do I need to do? Just all of those fears would rise up when I got done with my so-called work day. And I didn't know what to do with them. I just didn't know where to put them. And they still rise up. I mean, let's be honest. But I have a place and a way and a, and a toolkit now that's different. I don't have to drink over them. Um, I, I go to my meetings. I meet with my sponsor. I meet with other women in recovery. I ask for the help that I need. And I know that all I have to take care of is one day at a time. Uh, but I had to get to the rock bottom experiences to to get to cross over uh, into that and and that all happened in June of June of 2013 when I took my last drink the miracle is that as soon as I am done with dealing with my whatever my thing addiction uh, divorce plane crash infertility uh, God really often very quickly sends me some woman that it's my turn to help And it's happened over and over and over. And so I can say, me too. I can say, here's here's some of the ways that I made it through. What I've learned is that my job is to share my experience, strength, and hope. Whether that is related to an eating disorder or a divorce or uh, anything, fill in the blank, moving across the country. Uh, it's, it's about, well, here are a few suggestions. Here are some of the ways I have helped myself. I exercise, I journal, I seek counseling, I do this. I would want to tell them that they make a difference, that they are worthy and worth it, and um, that even on our most dark days, tomorrow will probably look different to you. The sun will rise and that um, it's not our job to understand or fix everything. The beautiful thing is that I, I feel like I've never had a time in my life that I didn't know God. Through every season, blessing, tragedy, experience, God is woven in. God is there. And so I know that I'm, I know that I am not thrown out to the wind. I know that this is not happenstance. I know that, uh, God already knew that this was going to happen, and, and I'm the only one that's shocked and surprised. <laughs> so, so it has been a huge piece of my, it's my mantle, it's my foundation, it's my hold on to constantly, it's my blanket, and, and that God never leaves. Diane knows what it feels like to hit rock bottom and to look up to find a God who heals, saves, and loves. She finds comfort and inspiration in the words of Jesus Calling. I got my first copy from my dear friend, Kelly Thorne Gore, who created iBloom. And she gave it to me, uh, and I had never heard of Jesus Calling. We had something that was called a, a life plan, and she brought this gift for me, and it was this Jesus Calling. And looking at my poor little book right here right now, I think she gave it to me. I was trying to, uh, I think it was 2005. I read it every day. So I guess that's what, 11 years of the same little book? It became our official devotional for our association. Jesus Calling is just a part of my every morning. It just feels raw. It feels real. It feels um, like we're not putting on airs. We're not living a double life in here. And that's probably what was just so authentic to me about it long before um, I realized I was living a double life. It just says, you know, come to me when you're hurting. It feels easy to take in, and it also feels easy to breathe out. Diane also talks about the new book from Sarah Young, Jesus Always, and how this book has helped her find joy, even in tough situations. I was so excited to get the new uh, Jesus Always. It came as a little surprise in my mailbox, and I thought, what, who has sent me this? (laughs) 
what a little miracle in my mail. You know, it feels like la another layer. It feels like another layer to the the beautiful mosaic that has already been created. This feels like the next uh, tool uh, that Sarah brought to us, so I'm very grateful. Diane will continue to share her story and be a cheerleader to all who cross her path. She believes that being a woman of vulnerability will help others tell their stories of rock bottom and find the healing she found. I think God is always going to be giving us these great little nuggets of showing us who we are. Who, you know, who we are is is so big and we sometimes close it in and and what I want to help women do is to open it up. Open up this great gift of you and and be willing to look back into who you used to be. You know, did you used to love to sing? Well, let's maybe bring that back out. Did you used to run in, in junior high and maybe you forgot that you actually like it? Um, and, and really just helping women start again, start again, and start again. And so those are the things that excite me, creating things, helping women start again, and, and taking women on brave adventures so that we can all see that we can do things that we don't think we can do. To find out more about Diane's book series, Rock Bottom is a Beautiful Place to Be, go to Diane's website at dianecunningham.com. Our featured passage for today's show comes from the August 20th entry of the Jesus Calling audiobook. I am a God who heals. I heal broken bodies, broken minds, broken hearts, broken lives, and broken relationships. My very presence has immense healing powers. You cannot live close to me without experiencing some degree of healing. However, it is also true that you have not because you ask not. You receive the healing that flows naturally from my presence, whether you seek it or not. But there is more, much more, available to those who ask. The first step in receiving healing is to live ever so close to me. The benefits of this practice are too numerous to list. As you grow more and more intimate with me, I reveal my will to you more directly. When the time is right, I prompt you to ask for healing of some brokenness in you or in another person. The healing may be instantaneous or it may be a process. That is up to me. Your part is to trust me fully and to thank me for the restoration that has begun. I rarely heal all the brokenness in a person's life. Even my servant Paul was told, my grace is sufficient for you when he sought healing for the thorn in his flesh. Nonetheless, much healing is available to those whose lives are intimately interwoven with mine. Ask and you will receive. Hear more great stories about the impact Jesus Calling is having all over the world. Be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling podcast on iTunes. We value your reviews and comments so we can reach even more people with the message of Jesus Calling. And if you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.